Hey guys, it's Harrison Scott Key here to read A Christmas Memory by Truman Capote. I'm here with Jenny, the dog, who can't read, but she understands words like food and Jenny. Uh, okay, here we go. I love this story. I hope you guys like it. This reading is only going to take about four hours, um, so it's perfect if you're waiting for Santa Claus to get here. Um, to start this and then by the time I'm finished it'll be next Christmas <clears throat> a Christmas memory by Truman Capote imagine a morning in late November a coming of winter morning more than 20 years ago consider the kitchen of a spreading old house in a country town a great black stove is its main feature but there is also a big round table and a fireplace with two rocking chairs placed in front of it just today, the fireplace commenced its seasonal roar. A woman with shorn white hair is standing at the kitchen window. She's wearing tennis shoes and a shapeless gray sweater over a summery calico dress. She's small and sprightly like a bantam hen, but due to a long youthful illness, her shoulders are pitifully hunched. Her face is remarkable, not unlike Lincoln's, craggy like that and tinted by the sun and wind, but it is delicate too, finely boned, and her eyes are sherry colored and timid. Oh my, she exclaims, her breath smoking the window pane. It's fruitcake weather. The person to whom she's speaking is myself. I am seven. She is 60-something. We are cousins, very distant ones, and we have lived together, well, as long as I can remember. Other people inhabit the house, relatives, and though they have power over us and frequently make us cry, we are not, on the whole, too much aware of them. We are each other's best friend. She calls me Buddy in memory of a boy who was formerly her best friend. The other buddy died in the 1880s when she was still a child. She is still a child. I knew it before I got out of bed, she says, turning away from the window with a purposeful excitement in her eyes. The courthouse bell sounded so cold and clear, and there were no birds singing. They've gone to warmer country. Yes, indeed. Oh, buddy, stop stuffing biscuit and fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. We've 30 cakes to bake. Look, there's a little dog in the picture, just like this one, except this one's nice and obeys. It's always the same. A morning arrives in November, and my friend, as though officially inaugurating the Christmas time of year that exhilarates her imagination and fuels the blaze of her heart, announces, It's fruitcake weather. Fetch our buggy. Help me find my hat. The hat is found. A straw cartwheel corsaged with velvet roses out of doors has faded. It once belonged to a more fashionable relative. Together, we guide our buggy, a dilapidated baby carriage, out to the garden and into a grove of pecan trees. The buggy is mine, that is. It was bought for me when I was born. It is made of wicker, rather unraveled, and the wheels wobble like a drunkard's legs. But it is a faithful object. Springtimes, we take it to the woods and fill it with flowers, herbs, wild fern for our porch pots. In the summer, we pile it with picnic paraphernalia and sugarcane fishing poles and roll it down to the edge of a creek. It has its winter uses too, as a truck for hauling firewood from the yard to the kitchen, as a warm bed for Queenie, our tough little orange and white rat terrier who has survived distemper and two rattlesnake bites. Queenie is trotting beside it now. And there you can see they, they've got the cart and there's the doggy and there's the people. Three hours later, we are back in the kitchen hauling a heaping buggy load of windfall pecans. Our backs hurt from gathering them. How hard they were to find the main crop having been shaken off the trees and sold by the orchard's owners, who are not us. Among the concealing leaves, the frosted, deceiving grass crackle. A cheery crunch, scraps of miniature thunder sound as the shells collapse and the golden mound of sweet, oily, ivory meat mounts in the milk glass bowl. Queenie begs to taste, and now and again my friend sneaks her a mite, though insisting we deprive ourselves. We mustn't, buddy. If we start, we won't stop, and there's scarcely enough as there is for 30 cakes. The kitchen is growing dark. Dusk turns the window into a mirror. Our reflections mingle with the rising moon as we work by the fireside in the firelight. At last, when the moon is quite high, we toss the final hull into the fire and with joined sighs, watch it catch flame. The buggy is empty. The bowl is brimful. We eat our supper, cold biscuits, bacon, blackberry jam, and discuss tomorrow. Tomorrow, the kind of work I like best begins, buying. 
cherries and citron, ginger and vanilla and canned Hawaiian pineapple, rinds and raisins and walnuts and whiskey and oh, so much flour, butter, so many eggs, spices, flavorings. Why, we'll need a pony to pull the buggy home. But before these purchases can be made, there is the question of money. Neither of us has any. Except for the skin flit sums, persons in the house occasionally provide, a dime is considered very big money. Or what we earn ourselves from various activities, holding rummage sales, selling buckets of hand-picked blackberries, jars of homemade jam and apple jelly and peach preserves, rounding up flowers for funerals and weddings. Once we won 79th prize, $5 in a national football contest. Not that we know a fool thing about football. It's just that we enter any contest we hear about. At the moment, our hopes are centered on the $50,000 grand prize being offered to name a new brand of coffee. We suggested AM, and after some hesitation from my friend thought it perhaps sacrilegious, the slogan AM, Amen, to tell the truth, our only really profitable enterprise was the fun and freak museum we conducted in the backyard woodshed two summers ago. The fun was a stereopticon with sly views of Washington and New York lent us by a relative who had been to those places. She was furious when she discovered why we had borrowed it. The freak was a three-legged bitty chicken hatched by one of our own hens. Everybody hereabouts wanted to see that bitty. We charged grown-ups a nickel. Kids, two cents. And took in a good $20 before the museum shut down due to the decease of the main attraction. The chicken died, Jenny. He just blows right past it. But one way and another, we do each year accumulate Christmas savings, a fruitcake fund. These monies we keep hidden in an ancient bead purse under a loose board, under the floor, under a chamber pot, under my friend's bed. Do you know what a chamber pot is, Jenny? It's where they put bad dogs. The purse is seldom removed from this safe location except to make a deposit. Or, as happens every Saturday, a withdrawal. Don't be scared. For on Saturdays, I'm allowed 10 cents to go to the picture show. That's what they called the movies back in, back, back when this was written, which was like 500 years ago. My friend has never been to a picture show, nor does she intend to. I'd rather hear you tell the story, buddy. That way I can imagine it more. Besides, a person my age shouldn't squander their eyes. When the Lord comes, let me see him clear. In addition to never having seen a movie, she has never eaten in a restaurant, traveled more than five miles from home, received or sent a telegram, read anything except funny papers in the Bible, sounds like my grandmother, worn cosmetics, cursed, wished someone harm, told a lie on purpose, let a hungry dog go hungry. Here are a few things she has done, or does do. Killed with a hoe, the biggest rattlesnake ever seen in this country, 16 rattles. Dip snuff, secretly. Not anymore, it's in a book. Tame hummingbirds, just try it till they balance on her finger, tell ghost stories, we both believe in ghosts. So tingling they chill you in July. Talk to herself, take walks in the rain, grow the prettiest japonicas in town, know the recipe for every sort of old-time Indian cure, including a magical wart remover. Now, with supper finished, we retire to the room in a faraway part of the house where my friend sleeps in a scrap quilt covered iron bed painted rose pink, her favorite color. Silently wallowing in the pleasures of conspiracy, we take the bead purse from its secret place and spill its contents on the scrap quilt. Dollar bills tightly rolled and green as may buds. Somber 50 cent pieces, heavy enough to weight a dead man's eyes. Lovely dimes, the liveliest coin, the one that really jingles. Nickels and quarters, worn smooth as creek pebbles, but mostly a hateful heap of bitter odored pennies. Last summer, Others in the house contracted to pay us a penny for every 25 flies we killed. Oh, the carnage of August, the flies that flew to heaven. Yet it was not work in which we took pride. And as we sit counting pennies, it is as though we were back tabulating dead flies. Neither of us has a head for figures. We count slowly, lose track, start again. According to her calculations, we have $12.73. According to mine, exactly $13. I do hope you're wrong, buddy. We can't mess around with 13. The cakes will fall or put somebody in the cemetery. Why, I wouldn't dream of getting out of bed on the 13th. This is true. She always spends 13ths in bed. So to be on the safe side, we subtract a penny and toss it out the window. Of the ingredients that go into our fruit cakes, whiskey is the most expensive as well as the hardest to obtain. State laws forbid its sale, but everybody knows you can buy a bottle from Mr. Ha Ha Jones. 
and the next day, having completed our more prosaic shopping, we set out for Mr. Haha's business address, a sinful, to quote public opinion, fish fry and dancing cafe down by the river. We've been there before and on the same errand, but in previous years, our dealings have been with Haha's wife, an iodine dark Indian woman with brassy peroxided hair and a dead tired disposition. Actually, we've never laid eyes on her husband, though we've heard he's an Indian too. A giant with razor scars across his cheeks. They call him Haha -Ha because he's so gloomy. That's irony, Jenny. I think. A man who never laughs. As we approach his cafe, a large log cabin festooned inside and out with chains of garish, gay, naked light bulbs and standing by the river's muddy edge under the shade of river trees where moth drifts through the branches like gray mist. Our steps slow down. Even Queenie stops prancing and sticks close by. People have been murdered in Ha Ha's Cafe, cut to pieces, hit on the head. There's a case coming up in court next month. Naturally, these goings-on happen at night when the colored lights cast crazy patterns and the Victrola wails. In the daytime, Ha Ha's is shabby and deserted. I knock at the door. Queenie barks. My friend calls. Mrs. Ha Ha, ma'am, anyone to home? Footsteps. The door opens. Our hearts overturn. It's Mr. Ha Ha Jones himself, and he is a giant. There you can see him. He's really big. He is a giant, and he does have scars. He doesn't smile. No. He glowers at us through Satan-tinted eyes and demands to know what you want with Ha Ha. For a moment, we are too paralyzed to tell. Presently, my friend half finds her voice, a whispery voice at best, if you please, Mr. Ha Ha, we'd like a quarter of your finest whiskey. His eyes tilt more. Would you believe it? Ha Ha is smiling, laughing too. Which one of you is a drinking man? It's for making fruitcakes, Mr. Ha Ha, cooking. This sobers him. He frowns. That's no way to waste good whiskey. Nevertheless, he retreats into the shadowed cafe and seconds later appears carrying a bottle of daisy yellow unlabeled liquor. He demonstrates its sparkle in the sunlight and says, Two dollars. We pay him with nickels and dimes and pennies. Suddenly, as he jangles the coins in his hand like a fistful of dice, his face softens. Tell you what, he proposes, pouring the money back into our bead purse. Just send me one of them fruitcakes instead. Well, my friend remarks on our way home, there's a lovely man. We'll put an extra cup of raisins in his cake. That must mean they don't like him. The black stove, stoked with coal and firewood, glows like a lighted pumpkin. Egg beaters whirl, spoons spin round in bowls of butter and sugar. Vanilla sweetens the air, ginger spices it, melting. Nose-tingling odors saturate the kitchen, suffuse the house, drift out to the world on puffs of chimney smoke. In four days, our work is done. Thirty-one cakes, dampened with whiskey, bask on the window sills and shelves. Who are they for? Friends. Not necessarily neighbor friends. Indeed, the larger share is intended for persons we've met maybe once, perhaps not at all. People who've struck our fancy, like President Roosevelt, like the Reverend and Mrs. J.C. Lucy, Baptist missionaries to Borneo who lectured here last winter, or the little knife grinder who comes through town twice a year, or Abner Packer, the driver of the six o'clock bus from Mobile who exchanges waves with us every day as he passes in a dust, cu dust cloud whoosh. Or the young Wistons, a California couple whose car one afternoon broke down outside the house and who spent a pleasant hour chatting with us on the porch. Young Mr. Wiston snapped our picture, the only one we've ever had taken. Is it because my friend is shy with everyone except strangers that these strangers and merest acquaintances seem to us our truest friends? I think yes. Also, the scrapbooks we keep of thank yous on White House stationery, time to time communications from California and Borneo, the knife grinder's penny postcard to make us feel connected to eventful worlds beyond the kitchen with its view of a sky that stops. Now a new December fig branch grates against the window. The kitchen is empty, the cakes are gone. Yesterday we carted the last of them to the post office where the cost of stamps turned our purse inside out. We're broke. That rather depresses me, but my friend insists on celebrating with two inches of whiskey left in Ha Ha's bottle. Queenie has a spoonful and a bowl of coffee. She likes her coffee chicory flavored and strong. That's the dog, you see. The dog drinks coffee. These people are weird. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. 
We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. The taste of it brings screwed up expressions. Sorry, I'm trying to get the dog up here, but she won't come because she's scared of Mr. Ha Ha. The rest we divide between a pair of jelly glasses. We're both quite awed at the prospect of drinking straight whiskey. The taste of it brings screwed up expressions and sour shudders. But by and by we begin to sing. The two of us singing different songs simultaneously. I don't know the words to mine, just come on along, come on along to the dark town strutters ball. But I can dance, that's what I mean to be, a tap dancer in the movies. My dancing shadow rollicks on the walls. Our voices rock the china where I think they're drunk. We giggle as if unseen hands were tickling us. Queenie rolls on her back. Her paws plow the air. Something like a grin stretches her black lips. Inside myself, I feel warm and sparky as those crumbling logs, carefree as the wind in the chimney. I should stop here and say that children should never drink any kind of liquor. I don't Even if you're dear old cousin gives it to you. My friend waltzes round the stove, the hem of her poor calico skirt pinched between her fingers as though it were a party dress. Show me the way to go home, she sings, her tennis shoes squeaking on the floor. Show me the way to go home. Sometimes I think this book may be a hallucination from somebody in a mental institution when you think about, like, where are the other people? Like, who's stopping all of this madness? These people need supervision. Here we go. Enter two relatives, very angry. Potent with eyes that scold. Tongue, bring me that dog. Come here, dog. This dog needs to be a part of this action. <clears throat> Very angry relatives. Potent with eyes that scold. Tongues that scold. Listen to what they... Listen, Jenny, listen to what they have to say. The words tumbling together into a wrathful tune. A child of seven, whiskey on his breath. Are you out of your mind? Feeding a child of seven must be loony. Road to ruination. Remember Cousin Kate, Uncle Charlie, Uncle Charlie's brother-in-law. Shame, scandal, humiliation. Kneel, pray, beg the Lord. Queenie sneaks under the stove. My friend gazes at her shoes. Her chin quivers. She lifts her skirt and blows her nose and runs to her room. This is them. They're in trouble because they got drunk. Probably not drunk, but definitely singing a lot. Long after the town has gone to sleep and the house is silent except for the chimings of clocks and the sputter of fading fire, she is weeping into a pillow already as wet as a widow's handkerchief. Don't cry, I say, sitting at the bottom of her bed and shivering despite my flannel nightgown that smells of last winter's cough syrup. Don't cry. I beg. Don't, Jenny, don't cry. Don't cry. I beg, teasing her toes, tickling her feet. You're too old for that. Sometimes this book reminds me of, um, what is that movie uh, where he sees dead people and you realize he's dead. <sighs> Don't cry. It's because, she hiccups, I am too old. Old and funny. Not funny. Fun. More fun than anybody. Listen, if you don't stop crying, you'll be so tired tomorrow we can't go cut a tree. She straightens up. Queenie jumps on the bed. Look at the picture. Where Queenie is not allowed to lick her cheeks. I know where we'll find pretty trees, buddy, and holly too, with berries big as your eyes. It's way off in the woods, farther than we've ever been. Papa used to bring us Christmas trees from there, carry them on his shoulder. That's 50 years ago. Well, now, now I can't wait for morning. See, he cheered her up. He cheered her up. She was sad. And now she's not. Morning. Frozen rhyme lusters the grass, the sun round as an orange, an orange as hot weather moon balances on the horizon, burnishes the silvered winter woods. A wild turkey calls, a renegade hall grunts in the undergrowth. Soon, by the edge of knee-deep, rapid running water, we have to abandon the buggy. Queenie wades the stream first, paddles across, barking complaints at the swiftness of the current, the pneumonia-making coldness of it. We follow, holding our shoes and equipment, a hatchet, a burlap sack above our heads, a mile more of chastening thorns, burrs, and briars that catch out our clothes, of rusty pine needles, brilliant with gaudy fungus and molted feathers. Here, there, a flash, a flutter, an ecstasy of shrillings remind us that not all the birds have flown south. Always the path unwinds through lemony sun pools and pitch black vine tunnels. Another creek to cross, a disturbed armada of speckled trout frosts the water around us, and frogs the size of plates practice belly flops. Beaver workmen are building a dam. On the farther shore, Queenie shakes herself and trembles. My friend shivers too, not with cold, but with enthusiasm. One of her hat's ragged roses sheds a petal as she lifts her head and inhales the pine-heavy air. 
We're almost there. Can you smell it, buddy? She says as though we were approaching an ocean. That's them looking for a tree. And indeed, it is a kind of ocean. Scented acres of holiday trees, prickly leafed holly, red berries shiny as Chinese bells, black crows swoop upon them screaming. Having stuffed our burlap sacks with an with enough greenery and crimson to garland a dozen windows, we set about choosing a tree. It should be, muses my friend, twice as tall as a boy, so a boy can't steal the star. The one we pick is twice as tall as me. A brave, handsome brute that survives 30 hatchet strokes before it keels with a creaking, rending cry. Lugging it like a kill, we commence the long trek out. Every few yards, we abandon the struggle, sit down, and pant but we have the strength of triumphant huntsmen. Bad in the trees, virile, icy perfume revives us, goads us on. Many compliments accompany our sunset return along the red clay road to town, but my friend is sly and noncommittal when passers-by praise the treasures perched in our buggy. What a fine tree, and where did it come from? Yonder way, she murmurs vaguely. Once a car stops and the rich mill owner's lazy wife leans out and whines, Give you two bitch cash for that old tree. Ordinarily, my friend is afraid of saying no, but on this occasion, she promptly shakes her head. We wouldn't take a dollar. The mill owner's wife persists. A dollar my foot? Fifty cents. That's my last offer. Goodness, woman, you can go get another one. In answer, my friend gently reflects. I doubt it. There's never two of anything. There's not even two of this dog. Look at this dog. If there were two of them, I'd have to give one away. Home. Queenie slumps by the fire and sleeps till tomorrow, snoring loud as a human. This is them arguing with that rich lady. I love to argue with rich ladies in cars. It is one of my favorite things to do. A trunk in the attic contains a shoebox of ermine tails off the opera cape of a curious lady who once rented a room in the house. Coils of frazzled tinsel gone gold with age, one silver star, a brief rope of dilapidated, undoubtedly dangerous candy-like light bulbs. Excellent decorations as far as they go, which isn't far enough. My friend wants our tree to blaze like a Baptist window, droop with weighty snows of ornament. But we can't afford the made in Japan splendors at the five and dime. So we do what we've always done, sit for days at the kitchen table with scissors and crayons and stacks of colored paper. I make sketches and my friend cuts them out. Lots of cats, fish too because they're easy to draw, some apples, some watermelons, a few winged angels derived from saved up sheets of Hershey bar tinfoil. We use safety pins to attach these creations to the tree. <laughs> well, you, well, you, I'm going to put you on the tree. Look, she, I don't, here, just, I'm going to wrap you up, put you under a tree. I'm going to give you to some child who needs some distraction where was I? something about hershey bar foil we use safety pins to attach these creations to the tree as a final touch we gave the dog away just kidding as a final touch we sprinkled the branches with shredded cotton picked in august for this purpose my friend surveying the effect clasps her hands together now honest buddy doesn't it look good enough to eat queenie tries to eat an angel that, now, that, that's the truest line in this whole book. The dog tries to eat something that wasn't supposed to be eaten. After weaving and ribboning holly wreaths for all the front windows, our, <laughs> our, next, our next project is the fashioning of family gifts. Tie-dye scarves for the ladies. For the men, a home-brewed lemon and licorice and aspirin syrup to be taken at the first symptoms of a cold and after hunting. But when it comes time for making each other's gift, my friend and I separate to work secretly. I would like to buy her a pearl-handled knife, a radio, a whole pound of chocolate-covered cherries. We tasted some once, and she always swears, I could live on them, buddy. Lord, yes, I could, and that's not taking his name in vain. This is a woman who gives hard liquor to a child, so whatever. Instead, I am building her a kite. She would like to give me a bicycle. She said so on several million occasions. If only I could, buddy. It's bad enough in life to do without something you want, but confound it, what gets my goat is not being able to give somebody something you want them to have. Only on one of these days I will, buddy. Locate you a bike. Don't ask how. Steal it, maybe. Instead, I'm fairly certain that she is building me a kite, the same as last year and the year before. The year before that, we exchanged slingshots. All of which is fine by me. For we are champion kite flyers who study the wind like sailors. My friend, more com... <laughs> the dog is upset because the story's coming to an end. 
for we are champion kite flyers who study the wind like sailors. My friend, more accomplished than I, can get a kite aloft when there isn't enough breeze to carry clouds. Here, here he is making a kite. If any of you people make me a kite for Christmas, I think it would be so sweet. Christmas Eve afternoon, we scrape together a nickel and go to the butchers to buy Queenie's traditional gift, a good gnawable beef bone. Would you like a beef bone? You can't understand English, can you? The bone wrapped in funny paper is placed high in the tree near the silver star. Queenie knows it's there. She squats at the foot of the tree, staring up in a trance of greed. When bedtime arrives, she refuses to budge. Her excitement is equaled by my own. I kick the covers and turn my pillow as though it were a scorching summer's night. Somewhere a rooster crows, falsely, for the sun is still on the other side of the world. Buddy, are you awake? It is my friend calling from her room, which is next to mine. And an instant later, she is sitting on my bed holding a candle. Well, I can't sleep a hoot, she declares. <clears throat> my mind's jumping like a jackrabbit. Buddy, do you think Mrs. Roosevelt will serve our cake at dinner? We huddle in the bed, and she squeezes my hand. I love you. Seems like your hand used to be so much smaller. I guess I hate to see you grow up. When you're grown up, will we still be friends? I say always. But I feel so bad, buddy. I want so bad to give you a bite. I tried to sell my cameo Papa gave me. Buddy, she hesitates as though embarrassed. I made you another kite. Then I confess that I made her one too, and we laugh. The candle burns too short to hold. Out it goes, exposing the starlight, the stars spinning at the window like a visible caroling that slowly, slowly daybreak silences. <clears throat> Excuse me. Possibly we doze, but the beginnings of dawn splash us like cold water. We're up, wide-eyed and wandering while we wait for others to waken. Quite deliberately, my friend drops a kettle on the kitchen floor. I tap dance in front of closed doors. One by one, the household emerges, looking as though they'd like to kill us both. But it's Christmas, so they can't. First, a gorgeous breakfast. Just everything you can imagine, from flapjacks and fried squirrel to hominy grits and honey in the cone, which puts everyone in a good humor except my friend and me. Frankly, we're so impatient to get at the presents, we can't eat a mouthful. Well, I'm disappointed. Who wouldn't be? With socks? A Sunday school shirt, some handkerchiefs, a hand-me-down sweater, and a year subscription to a religious magazine for children. The Little Shepherd, it makes me boil. It really does. My friend has a better haul. A sack of satsumas. That's her best present. She's proudest, however, of a white wool shawl knitted by her married sister. But she says her favorite gift is the kite I built her. And it is very beautiful. Though not as beautiful as the one she made me, which is blue and scattered with gold and green, good conduct stars. Moreover, my name is painted on it. Buddy, here's everybody waiting for Christmas presents. Buddy, the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing, and nothing will do till we've run to a pasture below the house where Queenie has scooted to bury her bone, and where, a winter hence, Queenie will be buried. There, plunging through the healthy waist-high grass, we unreel our kites, feel them twitching at the string like skyfish as they swim into the wind. Satisfied, sun-warmed, we sprawl in the grass and peel satsumas and watch our kites cavort. Soon I forget the socks and hand-me-down sweater. I'm as happy as if we'd already won the $50,000 grand prize in the coffee naming contest. Here they are, flying their kites. My, how foolish I am, my friend cries, suddenly alert, like a woman remembering too late that she has biscuits in the oven. You know what I've always thought, she asks in a tone of discovery, and not smiling at me, but a point beyond. I've always thought a body would have to be sick and dying before they saw the Lord. And I imagine that when he came, it would be like looking at the Baptist window, pretty as colored glass with the sun pouring through, such a shine you don't know it's getting dark. And it's been a comfort to think of that shine taking away all the spooky feeling. But I'll wager it never happens. I'll wager at the very end the body realizes the Lord has already shown himself. That things as they are, her hand circles in a gesture that gathers clouds and kites and grass and queenie pawing earth over her bone. Just what they've always seen was seeing him. As for me, I could leave the world with today in my eyes. This is our last Christmas together. Life separates us. Those who know best decide that I belong in a military school. 
and so follows a miserable succession of bugle-blowing prisons, grim, revelry-ridden summer camps. I have a new home, too, but it doesn't count. Home is where my friend is, and there I never go. And there she remains, puttering around the kitchen, alone with Queenie, then alone. Buddy, dear, she writes in her wild, hard-to-read script, Yesterday, Jim Macy's horse kicked Queenie bad. Be thankful she didn't feel much. I wrapped her in a fine linen sheet and rode her in the buggy down to Simpson's pasture where she can be with all of her bones. For a few Novembers, she continued to bake her fruit cakes single-handed. Not as many, but some. And of course, she always sends me the best of the batch. Also, in every letter, she encloses a dime wadded in toilet paper. See a picture show and write me the story. But gradually in her letters, she tends to confuse me with her other friend, the buddy who died in the 1880s. More and more, 13th are not the only days she stays in bed. A morning arrives in November, a leafless, birdless coming of winter morning when she cannot rouse herself to exclaim, Oh my, it's fruitcake weather. And when that happens, I know it. A message saying so merely confirms a piece of news some secret vein had already received, severing from me an irreplaceable part of myself, letting it loose like a kite on a broken string. This is why, walking across a school campus on this particular December morning, I keep searching the sky, as if I expected to see, rather like hearts, a lost pair of kites hurrying toward heaven. And here's the kites. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas, Jenny.